Good evening. This is Pastor Keith along with Ashley Jones here coming to you from Zion Hill Baptist Church in Spartanburg, South Carolina. We're glad that you've joined us this evening, some of you live, and some of you will watch this a little bit later. We're going to continue with our study this evening from Genesis. Now, part of what we're using for this study is Ashley's first book. She's written three. I'll get her to highlight those for you in just a moment. First one is A Glimpse at His Story. Uh, tell us a little bit about the book. It's about Genesis um, chapters 1 through 12, and it's just using historical evidences that back up God's Word. And there's only 19 in the book because this was written as a youth retreat weekend. I had to make myself stop. <laughs> and that's very important because as uh, you first start to read it, you can tell it was done uh, as a study. Mm -hmm. I'm glad that you did this. And I know many people have encouraged you to put it into a book form. Right. And since then, that has led to two more books, mm -hmm. and which are? Um, uh, Who Do You Say That I Am? Investigation Jesus. And that's 19 evidences of Jesus. That's historical evidences outside right. of God's Word. And then the newest one is about Exodus. And it has 60 evidences. I mean, that's a lot. 60 evidences for the Exodus. I know, I know a lot of what you covered in that. Mm-hmm. So I look forward to, once we get so far into Genesis, we'll probably go on over to Exodus and look at that. There's some really good stuff in there. Yeah. Let me say this in observation of the evidences, and um, you, you cover all the resources so people can look it up their self and see this is not something you dreamed up, <laughs> and it's not something on some kind of crazy websites. No. We know you can't believe everything you read on the Internet, but these are very valid resources. But what I like about it is it points to the validity of the Scripture and it helps people to think. Now, uh, I like what Robbie Zacharias has as part of their motto for that ministry or that he had there, which is helping believers to think and thinkers to believe. So I think that that's, that's pretty well what you're doing mm -hmm. with that. So it's very good. Now, last Sunday evening we talked about being in the beginning, Genesis chapter 1. We covered a lot, but there's still a lot to cover. It is. There's a lot in Genesis. A lot in Genesis. Yeah. And uh, But we're going to just sort of skip forward. We know that uh, God created everything that is. Let me stop right there. <laughs> All right, we had a question. We, we said that if anybody had a question, to give it to us. So one of the youth this evening, before we come here, said that a friend of his wanted to know it's a, it's a simple question and yet a, a very very important question he said how do we know it's real how do we know that god's real that this is true how do we know that now i'll give just a quick comment and then you follow that up if you would we know it's real because of the intelligent design so many scientists now, even who are not believers, will tell you that it could not just randomly happen because of all the things that science shows has to, not to have happened, but to be in place right now. <clears throat> it couldn't just happen. So intelligent design, uh, of course, from my standpoint, you have to have an intelligent designer right. in order just like this watch, it had to have a designer because there's too much to it. Right. It's too precise. All of these things. Nobody would walk out in the woods and find this watch laying there and would even think for one moment that it just happened. Right. Wow. What about this whole world, this universe, the human body, nature, everything? Mm -hmm. There's no way. No. No. Now, your comment was about the faith of an atheist. Right. It would take more faith for me to believe the other than it does for me to believe God's Word. Yes. Because, you know, just, you know, we were talking about all the proofs that were in the three books. And you right. know, I, I did a lot of research. And like I told you, you know, I read a lot, I research a lot. Mm -hmm. But for everything that I find, it builds my faith for right. everything. But on top of that, when I have that relationship, with God, yeah. that personal relationship, right. that growing relationship, I can I can come and I say, Keith, God did this for me. 
God did this for me. Right. You know, I can go over and over and over and, and tell you how many times that he stepped in and provided a need yeah. or answered a prayer over and over. That builds my faith. Absolutely. Trying God or seeing God's hand in your life. If people only have a, an intelligent relationship with God, that's not enough. No. There has to be that personal relationship with God. Uh, which has really played out in so many different ways. Listening to God, talking to God, mm -hmm. uh, communication. But again, if, if I had, and I, I like what you said, if I didn't see God working in my life, I would wonder if he's really there. That doesn't mean every day, but, but there is a timeline of things where he has done so many things in my life. I agree with you. So we're moving on to chapter two and chapter three, which is, Adam and Eve, mm -hmm. it breaks down how they were created. Uh, they were in a place of paradise. I can't imagine. No, no, <laughs> no. We don't know anything close to this. No. Many times we go to a spot and it's beautiful, maybe the mountains or wherever. You go there and you go with your families or whatever, and you say, this is like paradise. Yeah. But in reality, it's nothing close to the Garden of Eden. No, no. Uh, it is a place of, of where uh, there is no need. They have everything they need. There is no sin at this point. We to, can't imagine that. No, that's another thing, <laughs> right. Not only where they live, but the conditions they lived under. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they had responsibility, uh, keeping the garden and so forth. And the garden's different right then. We won't get into all that, but it's a little different. Uh, and so... In that place, God gives them some commands. You told me there were five five commands. Five commands: um, be fruitful, multiply, replenish, exercise domin dominion, and do not give it to another. And refrain from eating of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Now, why does God give us commands? To keep us safe. Keep us safe. You know, we were talking before. Mm -hmm. As parents, we give our children right. commands. And we put guidelines and boundaries and rules. Right. But that's not to be mean. No. That's to keep them safe. We give them guidelines, rules, limits, however you want to put it, because we love them. Right. And we want them to be safe. Anytime God says throughout his word, do not, it is for our good. Right. Uh, and, and that's proven throughout the word of God. Because he's a loving heavenly father, a loving creator. Mm -hmm. And specifically in what we're looking at. So let's get to this, the last one. You talked about that they could not eat from the tree. The tree. Singular. <laughs> Singular. Now the Bible lets us know that there were many trees. Right. But only this one tree. So it isn't that this was an unfair situation God had put them in. Yeah. As a matter of fact, I would almost think... They almost had to go looking for this one tree. Right. We've got this whole beautiful place like paradise. All these animals, the rivers, uh, five rivers flowing into it and so forth. All these things going on. So it's not some little bitty place. And one tree. One tree. This is significant. It is. It shows God's love for them. And yet it shows that they had to have a choice. Now I was reading Wearsby just a little bit earlier. And he highlighted the word in chapter 2, verse 16, as he told the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. The word freely, you may freely eat. No limits. Eat whatever you want to, except for this one tree. So why did they have that? Choice. A choice. They had to have a choice. Right. Why does? Why did they have to have a choice? Because it's not love if you don't have a choice. Right. You, you can't make somebody love you. No. It wouldn't be love. It wouldn't be love. They would not. They or they would be robots. Yeah. If there was no choice, many people ask this question: Why did he give them a choice? Why was there this one tree? If there was no trees. No tree, no choice. Uh, and, and you think about it. All it was was trespassing his command. It wasn't that they went out and murdered or anything. There's only two people in the world. 
all the, those things, but this, because they had to love him and obey him in the sense of that loving relationship. So they had to have a choice. Man still has a choice today. Yes, he does. It's still a choice. It was a choice on the cross when the two thieves went on each side of Jesus. They had a choice. And really, that's a picture of the whole world. Mm -hmm. That they would call on him for salvation or not. So they're given this choice. And uh, that's recorded in chapter 2. Then we get over to chapter 3. And we see Adam and Eve in the garden. And along comes Satan in the form of this serpent. Um, and he begins to, as he always does, cast doubt on the Word of God. I used three words that we were looking at a moment ago, but doubting is the first one. Mm -hmm. And what Satan does, you know, we were talking about this before, he gives you just a little bit of the truth yeah. with a twist. Yeah. And that always is a lie. Right. And we know from Scripture he's called the father of of lies. All lies. Yes. Yep. yep. Jesus said that he was the father of lies. The um, so he causes doubt, uh, and he does that today. Has God said? And he, and he cast doubt all the way through. Uh, it's, Satan really does nothing new. Right. We might could say he just does it to new people. Yeah. But he he comes in the same way. This is important because if we understand the method of Satan, then we can be on the alert for his lies and so forth. To recognize the enemy. Yes, yes. So he says that they are to, um, he's, or he comes with this doubt, has God really said? So he plants this in Eve's mind right away. Has God said? And then he denies, he flat out denies, God has not said this. He, he has not, you know, said these things. And he he, began, he he works in her mind to deceive her. The New Testament tells us that very plainly, that Eve was deceived. Now, before we go any further, we got into a conversation before we went on the air about, and really, I never thought about this, all right? He's got two people in the whole world. They have just sinned. They're about to sin. Yeah. Now, when they do, why not let them die and just create two more? He had just done it. We don't, we're, we don't know how long they were in the garden before right. they sinned. Right. We don't think it was long. Right. They hadn't had children yet and so forth. So uh, two people, just two, yeah. if they die, all he's got to do is start pulling the dirt together once again yep. and breathe into that, the breath of life, and there he can start over. Adam number two right. and Eve number two. Right. Why did because of love. Right. You know, we when we were talking about it before, it made me think of the verse that's mm -hmm. in Matthew where he talks about the 99, but he yeah. left the 99 for just the one. One. And, you know, I ask you, if it would have just been the one, mm -hmm. would he have sent Jesus to die? Right. Yes. And he, he would have. He would have because he loved us that much. Our relationship yes. with him was that important that to important. him. I think if anyone's listening and doubting that God loves them, this is a key right here to the great love of God. Two people, he could have just let them die in their sin, but he didn't. Right. That shows the awesome love of God. Uh, tremendous thought, tremendous uh, truth here. So, Satan gets Eve to doubt the word. He denies the word. And I'll confess, I forgot the other one here. <laughs> delusion. He brings delusion to it. So uh, he's doing all this with the word. Eve eats from the fruit. And she is deceived. Adam goes in with his eyes open. Every indication is that he did. He makes a choice here. Right. The choice is greater than just eating the fruit. He eat it with her, the Bible says, but he chose the relationship he had with Eve over the relationship he had with God. Right. That shouldn't surprise us. Shouldn't surprise us. How many things today, I mean, just, just kind of applying it today, how many things today do we put before God? Well, you know, I'm a pastor. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just giving you something to think about here. You know, we, we want to blame Adam and Eve. 
Right. Well, they brought sin into the world. It was their choice. Mm -hmm. But we're just as guilty. Yeah, we're, we're just, just as guilty. We're just as guilty. And as I was going to say, as a pastor, I was thinking some people chose not to come to church and worship God corporately, which we are told to do, but they chose to do something else. So, right, we can't throw rocks at Adam. That's still happening today. Let me, you know, and we may have to cut this short. Uh, we always get into this and go farther and farther, <laughs> but it's so rich. Uh, a lot of people ask, how did evil get into the world? Now, we didn't talk about this beforehand, but evil is not a thing floating around. No. Evil cannot happen on its own. No. Evil happens when we choose to do wrong. And again, it gets us back to that choice. But I want to hit this because some people say, well, if God created everything, did God create evil? And he didn't. Right. He didn't. Evil is a result of the choices we make. Evil now is within the heart of man because of our fallen nature. We, we choose to do evil because of that fallen nature. So it's a result of our choices. All right, so... Let's quickly get to what God's response was to their sin. Okay. Um, well, we find that in Genesis 3.21. And in Genesis 3.21, um, God's word says, And unto uh, I'm sorry, and unto Adam also, and to his wife, did the Lord God make coats of skin and clothe them. Now that is the first death yes. in God's word. You know, we want to say that it's Abel. No, yeah, no, 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 not. it's not. This is the first death. Good and point. God God um, killed this, mm -hmm. um, whatever kind of animal it was, goat, whatever. He made skins for them to wear. And yeah. me and you were talking about this before. Right. Because I remember that from growing up. You know, it's kind of one of those things you just know mm -hmm. your kid in church. But when I went back and I studied that, it really hit me. I mean, I mean, really hit me. I sit down and I thought... And I was sitting on my bed and my closet's over here. And I looked over at my closet. And I'm like, you know, I really take for granted mm -hmm. going in there, picking out clothes. Mm -hmm. Could you imagine Adam and Eve, after God killed and sacrificed that first animal to cover their sin, yeah. uh. the next morning when they had to wake up and they had to look down and see that they were covered in that offering? Yeah. And I've never thought about that. It's a tremendous point when you tell me that. It's a reminder every day of their sin. And I want to say the cost of their, of their sin. Because they tried to cover themselves right. with the leaves. And that was not sufficient because they were trying to cover. It actually, it wasn't just their bodies. It was their sin. And so... The high price of our sin is the shed blood. Mm -hmm. It was a long time before I understood that or realized that in this passage, and which is going to be throughout the Word of God all the way down to Christ's death, of course. Right. Genesis 3.15 is the first prophecy that points toward Christ coming one day. Mm -hmm. so high cost of our mm -hmm. sin, it isn't that we just have to go do a few things, do a few good deeds, and that takes care of it. No. No, the punishment of an infinite God yes. is an infinite punishment. Mm. So we had to have a Savior that was going to come and take that, not just for Adam, right. but for everybody from Adam on till today. That covers me too. Right. But think of salvation now. When I accept Jesus and what he did on that cross, it's a different kind of covering. Sure. But it's the covering that started right here. Oh yeah, it started right there. Those of the Old Testament period looked forward to that sacrifice. All of the sacrifices that were given, you know, we know that those really couldn't forgive their sin, but they looked forward to the ultimate sacrifice, Christ. Right. And the Old Testament saints were covered under that. Looking forward, we're covered under that and forgiven looking backward. Can I just say that I'm thankful that we live on this side of the cross? <laughs> That's a good point. Really? That's a good point. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but all through the Old Testament, people say, well, what's all those sacrifices about and why do they have to do that? 
every time. Now, when you get a couple more chapters and you're going to read in the genealogies, so-and-so was born, they begot, somebody was born, and he died. Over and over it says, and he died. It's a ringing echo of the, of the uh, high price of sin, death. And that's what we're looking at right here. And all those sacrifices continually reminding the high cost of our sin. Hebrews says that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission or forgiveness of sin. Right. All the way back here to Adam and Eve. Uh, man's efforts cannot cover their sin, and it cannot today. So many people believe that if they just do more good than bad, but that's not found in the Word of God. No. It's not about what you do. Right. It's about what he did. Right. And just as Adam had a choice, he set himself up as a decider. I can decide what I want to do. Hmm. And he chose to take that. Right. To take that fruit and take a bite. Right. The same thing is for us today. We're a decider. And when we choose Jesus and what he did on that cross, that affects our eternity. Yeah. It's a little bit different choice, I know, but it's still equally as important because him choosing that, one bite, sin came into the world. Sin, one bite. Yeah, right. one bite. But just through one decision, mm -hmm. we can be restored to God. Yeah. It's a, but, but it all fits, and, and it all makes perfect sense. And man wants to do something to cover sin. He wants to feel good about himself that I did this, but we can't. And we'll wrap it up here because we could go on and on. And Lord willing, next Sunday evening we will uh, do the next part of this. But I want to say, again, I find that more people watch these than what I really realize. And if you're out there and you've come to this understanding, it's not what we can do, as Ashley said. It's what Christ has already done. He paid the ultimate price you see, those animals that God the Father sacrificed outside the Garden of Eden had done nothing wrong. That is the pattern. Throughout Israel's history, they had to bring the lambs without blemish because it had to show that they were the perfect sacrifice, the innocent sacrifice. So when Christ came to earth, born of a virgin, he did not have a sin nature, never did anything wrong, so he never committed a sin, when he was placed upon the cross, he was the perfect Lamb of God. Now, one of our men here, Louis Gregory, told me this one time. He said in the Old Testament, when the people would bring their sacrifice to the priest to be sacrificed for them, their families, he said the priest never looked at the person to see if they were worthy. He always looked at their sacrifice. Was it worthy? When God looks at us, if all we're offering to him is our good works, it is not worthy. But if, we, if Christ is our Savior, he sees Christ as our sacrifice. And that is the sacrifice, the only sacrifice that could forgive my sin, cleanse us, and give us salvation. So I want to encourage you, if you have never received Christ as your Lord and Savior, and you understand it's all about what he did. You can bow right now and ask Christ, telling him, I see you paid the price, and I accept that as the forgiveness of my sin. Come into my life, and I will follow you as my Lord and my Savior. Now, Romans tells us, whoever believes in the name of the Lord, or excuse me, calls on the name of the Lord, shall be saved, and God keeps his promises. Today can be your spiritual birthday. The day you were born again spiritually, if you will call on him. Let's end in prayer. Ashley, thank you. Thanks, As we look over these things, and it's, uh, it's, so, it's so great. We started out this study last week talking about origin, one of the four great questions, origin, and we're still looking at that. And in one sense, we could say it's the origin of sin, right. the origin of sacrifice, and so forth. So. Uh, let us pray with you. Father, we thank you for each one who has and will be tuning in to this short video. And Father, we pray that uh, you would speak to their hearts and help anyone who has not received you as their Savior. 
that they would see the great sacrifice, the ultimate sacrifice for their sin, and they would call on you for salvation. We thank you, and we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We look forward to seeing you next week. God bless you.